After my video on Sonic Adventure 2, you would think I've made my case on Sonic the Hedgehog, but when have I? JFJ's reviews ever been known to get off the ride before it comes to a conclusion. I said we'd do it one day, okay? Anyway, yes, the Sonic the Hedgehog is, was, distinctive a thon, you gotta come up with a better name for that at some point, is gonna cover as much of the series as I see fit. Doesn't sound as catchy as all-inclusive, but if it was, we'd be talking about Sonic Jam for the Gamecom. So what are we talking about today? Well, you clicked on the video, so you know we're tackling 2004's Sonic Heroes, a very important game in Sonic's history, as last time we established that Sonic Adventure 2 was the final Sonic game released on a Sega console, but also the first to be released on Nintendo, with Sonic Adventure 2 Battle dropping on the GameCube alongside Sonic Advance for the GBA. I'm guessing it was still a mystery as to what direction Sega was going to go in, though, as the sixth generation was when the three competing consoles we have now, Nintendo, Sony, and Microsoft, were solidified as the only game console makers, and anything else was not worth anyone's time. A lot of Sega games like Shenmue or Jet Set Radio would make their way to Microsoft's Xbox, and Sony's PlayStation 2 was the most popular console of its day, but a character like Sonic would appeal a lot to the Nintendo audience, hence the sales of Sonic Adventure 2 Battle. Well, Sega actually did a pretty decent job supporting Sonic on all platforms, as after the GameCube got the Mega Collection, the PS2 and the Xbox got the Mega Collection Plus with even more games. More importantly, the big three new Sonic games of that era, Sonic Heroes, Shadow the Hedgehog, and Sonic Riders all saw release on the PlayStation 2, Xbox, and GameCube, with Sonic Heroes and Sonic Riders also getting PC ports. Going forward, I don't see as much of a need to do in-depth version comparisons for Sonic games anymore. Like with Sonic 1 and 2, certain mechanics and levels were added and changed, thus adding to the experience of the mobile remasters. In Sonic CD's case, the PC version made some improvements over the Sega CD version, and the remaster from 2011 proved to be the definitive version for several reasons. Sonic 3 Angel Island Revisited was a fan project, but a damn fine one at that. And then, the adventure games had ports that completely changed things, and with change comes preference. These games were cross-platform, so there isn't as much to say. I recorded a decent bit of Sonic Heroes in the GameCube, but my primary playthrough was on the PC for widescreen as to fit with what I've been doing for the previous games. The GameCube and Xbox versions of Heroes, Shadow, and Riders are plenty fine, though. The PS2 versions were the ones I played as a kid, as it was my console, but of course, the PlayStation 2 versions of the Sonic games minus Mega Collection were god-awful. Like, the PS2 version of Heroes can barely run at the lower frame rate it has over the GameCube release, chugs consistently, and has far lower audio quality, and the character shadows are replaced by these black circles underneath them. Somebody end the madness! So anyway, what's so special about Sonic Heroes? Well, the previous two games both had six playable characters, but Sonic Heroes busts in like the Kool-Aid Man with 12 playable characters. Don't worry though. Sonic Heroes, despite having double the amount of playable characters, actually has the least amount of gameplay styles the 3D series has seen yet. Sonic Heroes is the sequel to Sonic Adventure 2, but the game is not called Adventure 3 for a reason. Sonic Heroes was trying something a bit different for the multi-platform debut. Sonic Adventure 1 and 2 had gameplay that was fueled by the storyline, each campaign tying into one another to reveal angles of the plot that you may have missed if you just played one of them. Sonic Heroes decided to take that, drastically downplay the story, while still having it to some extent, keeping the gameplay pretty much intact, but going back to the Genesis games for structure. Like the first few Sonic games, we play through zones that have no connection to the story whatsoever, have two acts each, then a boss fight. All in an attempt to harken back to the old days, while still being a new 3D Sonic game in its own right. So to start, we can pick any one of the four campaigns. The 12 characters are divided into teams of three. Team Sonic, obviously consisting of Sonic, Tails, and Knuckles. Team Dark, consisting of the returning Shadow, Rouge, and newcomer E123 Omega. I can get back to that in a bit. Team Rose with Amy, Cream the Rabbit, and Big the Cat returning from Sonic Adventure. And lastly, Team Chaotix with Espio the Chameleon, Charmy B, and Vector the Crocodile. Each team plays almost exactly the same, will go through the same exact stages in the same order with small differences to warrant a revisit like Sonic 3 and Knuckles did. You can switch between teammates just the press of a button, and every team has one character that emphasizes a specific trait. There's a speed character, a flying character, and a power character. Since we're already in the midst of the review, let's just waste no more time to talk about Team Sonic. Like I said, for this we have the main trio, Sonic, Tails, and Knuckles. The playthrough opens up as Tails and Knuckles find Sonic with a note from Dr. Eggman saying that in three days he'll conquer the world, and if they think they can stop him, they better try it now. With a challenge like that, Team Sonic heads off to save the day. Yeah, that's pretty much it. Like, that's the status quo during Team Sonic's story, nothing about it really changes by the time the game's over. Well, a couple levels in, we see that the three days thing was a trick to delay the heroes from stopping his real plan, but that's basically it. Like established, in Heroes you control three characters at once and switch between them to accomplish different tasks. To start with the main type, we have the speed characters, Sonic, Shadow, Amy, and Espio. 
fundamentally, controlling these characters should not be foreign to anyone that already played the speed stages of Sonic Adventure 1 and Sonic Adventure 2, as the name of the game is the same. You need to get from the start of the stage to the end by avoiding obstacles, homing attacking enemies, and all that jazz. There are a few changes though, namely the controls. If I were to name one, I'd say the controls are the biggest issue people have with Sonic Heroes, as the top speed is much higher than the adventure games, making accuracy much more difficult as the characters are much slipperier. Bringing a character like Sonic into 3D was always going to be more challenging than Mario, Link, or Mega Man, and that's always because of his high speed. And hell, the classic games already suffered from Sonic's speed by having obstacles that you couldn't possibly see coming. The adventure games thankfully nailed this, as even though I thought Sonic Adventure 1 controlled a little better than SA2, both still did an excellent job managing things like turning and platforming while also playing as a character that could reach speeds no other platforming mascot could. From Sonic Heroes onward, it's regrettable to say that they never captured this magic in any of the games to follow the adventure titles. However, I don't think a game is out for the count for an issue like controls not being as good as a previous entry. Take a series I talk about way too often, for example, Sly Cooper. In Sly 2 and 3 especially, Sly's movement was so fluid and perfect, it just felt like you can do anything with his weightless physics, his side jumps, and backflips. Something I used to hold over Sly 4 was that I thought the controls were a massive downgrade over the previous two games in particular because they gave Sly so much more weight when doing pretty much everything from turning to jumping. It was actually my fondness for Sonic Heroes that taught me to give Sly 4 a little more credit. Just a little bit. A game's content can still offer fun even if it's not as perfectly executed as a previous entry. And that is why I still enjoy Sonic Heroes quite a bit. But it cannot be ignored that the increased acceleration of the speed characters in this game from the adventure games leads to moments that would be really simple on those games becoming the speed character bouncing from wall to wall in this game. But I think Sonic Heroes' level design was built in a way that works with the gameplay we have here, hence why I find it really satisfying to speed through loops and other set pieces at the highest automated speeds we've gone at yet in the series. The thing I enjoy doing the most as the speed characters, in particular Sonic and Shadow, are the new moves. Replacing the time-honored spin dash is the Rocket Excel. This mechanic's not particularly well received, but what can I say, I've always enjoyed using it. It works in a simple enough way where if you're running and press the B button, the speed character will do a fast slide kick, but if all your teammates are lined up for this, you'll go flying with this colorful effect surrounding you to show that you did it right. In combat and platforming scenarios, the Rocket Excel will take time off your run as you need to use the Tornado ability to go up these poles, for example, but the Excel and a level 3 homing attack do the job as well. I would not want something like this to replace the spin dash outright, as I think the spin dash in SA1 did a great job at all things, picking up speed, accessing hidden routes, etc. But I think the Rocket Excel is pretty cool, sometimes giving me access to higher areas like SA1 did, using it increases your team blast gauge, making it a great spin dash alternative that plays well with the other mechanics that are specific to Sonic Heroes. Doing a better job than the spin dash from SA2 if I'm being honest, as in SA2, the spin dash would require you to slow down as using the B button while on the move in that game would cause Sonic and Shadow to slide, which can be fun in the mods, but in the base game would kill your speed on the spot. I also like using Sonic and Shadow's Tornado ability as a platforming tool as it grants you extra height for your jumps, but much less so for Espio and Amy. But Espio goes invisible, so that's cool. Sonic, Shadow, and Espio can also cling to walls and bounce between them, with Espio being able to do it without dropping if you don't press a button like Sonic and Shadow do, which I think is a great callback to Knuckles' as Chaotix while working into the mechanics of Sonic Heroes, Amy being the worst of the speed characters to play for these reasons. As Amy and Espio, the Rocket Excel is much more ineffective, as they do have the slide kick like Sonic and Shadow, but they also have the secondary moves of Amy swinging her hammer and Espio throwing shurikens. These two abilities just get in the way, when what I like about the slide kick is the instant speed boost you get from it. But besides that, the speed type gameplay is exactly what you'd expect from the previous games. Running, homing attacking, light speed, dash trails, and grinding on rails, which has been kept from Adventure 2 as a staple mechanic of the series. Now for a more substantive storyline, Team Dark. Hmm. Rouge the Bat has broken into an Eggman base to steal his secret treasure only to find the ultimate life form, Shadow the Hedgehog, in a capsule, surviving his fall from Sonic Adventure 2. The writer for both this game and Adventure 2, Shiro Mayakawa, had fully intended for Shadow's only game to be Adventure 2, however his popularity was massive when that game released, so Sega wanted him brought back. It's fair to say that bringing Shadow back after killing him off with a completed character arc in the SA2 will always take something away from that ending, However, you may have noticed that I didn't really focus on Shadow much by the end of the SA2 video, because Shadow's death never really hit me that hard, and that's because I played all these other games with Shadow in it before that. So for me in my first playthrough, the joy of SA2's ending was finally being able to connect the pieces from what I had seen of Shadow in all the other games, rather than being sad about his actual death. What did intrigue me about the ending was the moments I did talk about in more depth last time, like Eggman's final lines. But anyway, back to what's happening. The capsule is being guarded by a new character, E123 Omega, who fires at Shadow and Rouge, with Shadow's first instinct being to protect her. 
Yeah, what a selfish prick, am I right? The deal here is that Rouge wants treasure from the Doctor and sees an opportunity here. Shadow mysteriously has lost his memory and needs to know from Dr. Eggman what happened to him after Adventure 2 that got him sealed up in this base to begin with. And Omega wants revenge against Dr. Eggman because he was just put on guard duty for Shadow and not given a real mission. Omega as a character is a great addition. Originally, they wanted to bring back E-102 Gamma from Adventure 1, but settled on bringing Shadow back instead, and then created a new E-Series character. I love this because bringing Gamma back as is doesn't really make any sense at all because his character as we knew him was dead. The bird was freed and the robotic shell was destroyed. Shadow is the ultimate life form. I'm sure he can survive a fall to Earth in super form, no less. After all, he survived being sent out of the capsule by Maria 50 years ago when Sonic was going to die in that trap. Omega's design is basically if he took Gamma and made him into a killing machine. I love Omega in this game. Eggman makes this robot that is equipped with lasers and rockets and flamethrowers and just puts him on guard duty in one room thousands of feet below ground and then sends junk bots out to kill Sonic. Like, what? So now, Omega has set out to destroy the Eggman Empire for wasting his talents. While in stages, he has all these lines while destroying Eggman mechs like Worthless consumer models! Or Well, that's a load off my back! If Shadow and Rouge get knocked out during boss battles. But at the end of the day, these three actually form a really great bond. Shadow and Rouge continuing the one they had from Adventure 2, and Omega just adding some comedy to the mix that made these three an iconic pairing in the Sonic fandom, and you can bet that I'll be talking a lot about them in the coming games. Side note, I think Rouge's design's pretty cool in this game as well. I made note of Rouge being the first major female character added to the game cast since Amy. There also exists the law that female Sonic characters have to wear clothes when the male ones don't. I think changing Rouge's design like they did was interesting simply because there wasn't a precedent at the time that she had to look like she did in Adventure 2. So sure, change the color of her eyelids from blue to pink, give her a different outfit, why not? So then we have the matter of Shadow's memory. The writer clearly needed Shadow to have something new to do with his arc from Adventure 2 being done. And this is what was settled on. Shadow was sealed inside a pod in Eggman's base, and then four zones in, you find a bunch of similar pods, which leads to the boss fight where a clone of Shadow is seen on the ground. By the end of the story, Rouge gets confirmation that Eggman is amassing an army of Shadow androids, which makes her sad, as she really did come to care for Shadow by the end of Adventure 2, and is unsure if the one they've been rolling around with is the real deal. Hey Omega, did I ever tell you that Shadow is a robot, and... Oh, never mind. Good luck! You know about cloning. The original must exist somewhere. I always liked that line from Omega. Like I said, all these characters grew something from this mission, and now Omega, of all people, is the one to comfort Rouge over the fact that the original Shadow must be out there somewhere. This was the first Sonic game to end with an unresolved storyline of Shadow's status as the real Shadow or a fake. But I like how, much like the real Shadow, he doesn't care about that now. He's focused on his mission to the bitter end. This doctor. Even if I'm not real, I'm still the ultimate life form, Shadow the Hedgehog. I also think that there's plenty of evidence that this is the real Shadow. One, Eggman doesn't care to give most of his creations super rich personalities, so I doubt a Shadow Android would have as much introspection and banter as this guy does. What's up? Something on your mind? Well, hmm, never mind. Let's go. That, that blue, blue hedgehog, hedgehog like me. me. What, what did, did the doctor, doctor say about, about my memory? memory? Just who am I? Like, clearly Rouge has filled him in on what's been happening, or else he wouldn't be able to say lines like this. All this for what? Nothing? I might as well go look for that Master Emerald, since that irritating echidna is here. <laughs> Some things never change, do they? What are you saying? What else is a famous treasure man supposed to do? See, people, he's just a neutral dude. This isn't that hard. And that's what I love about Team Dark the most, it's just now that Shadow's mission's done, he can just be friends with Rouge and Omega, because why not? They have personalities that go together well, and they get along. Nothing more to it. Anyway, my second and most important reason is that this Shadow was secluded from the rest that are just being mass-produced. Like, he has special significance because he's the original Ultimate Life Form. Case closed. With Rouge as the leader of Team Dark, that leads me into the discussion of the flight-type gameplay. Tails, Rouge, Cream, and Charmy. The characters who, if I had to guess, are probably the characters you'll play as the least. When you swap to the flying characters, they control their team in this implausible totem pole, and when jumping, you can fly with the meter under the icon clearly establishing how much energy they have left. You will mainly use them when you need to get up higher or knock enemies out of the air with the Thundershoot ability, where the flight character will send their allies at enemies. Pretty handy. Using the flight character to maintain your balance when trying to platform is important, as the speed characters just aren't the best for platforming this time around. 
And this is something I find crucial to the gameplay of Sonic Heroes. The game has its own set of mechanics that we have to work with. I think the dynamic of the flight characters is a bit unorthodox, but I think the developers pulled it off well enough. Sonic Heroes has a good flow to it as you switch between the different characters when you need their abilities the most. Specifically, carrying the momentum from the speed character into a jump with the fly character is always satisfying. I speak of the flight gameplay with this, well, they did their best kind of attitude because this goes back to the Adventure 1 review. Sonic Heroes, from the concept, has the potential to be a 3D Sonic game where you get open-ended Sonic 3K styled levels where all these characters with different abilities, Sonic Speed, Tails' as Flight and Knuckles' as Gliding and Climbing Walls can be used at the drop of a hat, creating the most robust 3D Sonic gameplay in history. But that's just not gonna happen. Why did Knuckles have to collect emeralds in SA1 and SA2? because gliding and climbing walls would just nullify linear stage objectives in 3D. Tails had a nothing story in Adventure 1 because of that fact. I'm sure that with a proper development time dedicated to the idea that the people making these Sonic games could make a 3D Sonic game more along the lines of the ROM hack Sonic Classic Heroes where you play the campaign of Sonic 1 and 2 with 3 and Knuckles mechanics. Character swapping, and yeah, a lot of freedom. But again, that's 2D and this is 3D. It requires a lot more dev time to balance that out and Sonic games just don't get that. That's an external factor that affects most Sonic games, unfortunately, so no, this game is not an epic 3 and Knuckles type game with characters switching in 3D. But I'm also not just being an apologist at the same time, because if I think a Sonic game sucks, I'm just gonna say so. While this game's concept has the potential to be something much different, and arguably better, I also have a problem with Sonic Heroes' existing design philosophy. There are seven zones in Heroes, with two levels each, like I said. There are some levels that are bad in this bunch. Casino Park and Bingo Highway rely upon this pinball gimmick, and it's just the worst. Like, ignoring the camera perspective, as the game uses both a third-person and top-down pinball board, the controls here are just insanely unresponsive, sometimes killing runs of Team Sonic's secondary missions in a snap. I can see why you wouldn't like the near-endless grinding of Rail Canyon and Bullet Station, but I never had a problem with it personally. Maybe it takes a little too long, but I think it's a cool concept for a stage. I also don't like these elevator rides and power plant that can only skip as Team Dark. Besides that, though, I think Sonic Heroes has a consistent set of fun stages to mess around with. A complaint given to Sonic Adventure 2 would be how the speed stages are far more linear than those of a Sonic Adventure 1. Sonic Heroes remedies this pretty well, where stages have plenty of moments with slight diversions that require a different teammate. Like maybe the speed character will run down the hill, or the flight character will go over towards the hidden collectible above that. Maybe I'll use the light dash to get over there instead of taking the spring. I think the levels in this game offer plenty for the curious mind to find that takes advantage of all the characters. Also having a decent amount of set pieces, too. Set pieces in Sonic Heroes like these boulders chasing you in Ocean Palace or this alligator in the swamp can be ruined by a certain something I'll get into later, but in theory, I think destroying whole battleships in Egg Fleet, avoiding lasers in Final Fortress, shooting out of a cannon and destroying a base in Bullet Station, running down a castle wall in Hang Castle are fun moments of the game. And with that said, you have heard that I enjoy using the speed characters during normal gameplay. I think the flight characters add an extra element of exploration and platforming aid and levels have fun set pieces. I hope you can see why I think Sonic Heroes is fun to play with all that said already. Team Rose's campaign. We're up. Come on. Okay, here we go. Amy Rose wonders about the whereabouts of Sonic the Hedgehog as the newspaper clipping shows that Sonic has captured Froggy and Chocola Chow. Froggy being the pet of Big the Cat from SA1, who is now friends with Amy, I suppose. And Chocola the Chow is the twin brother of Cheese the Chow, the owner of whom is Cream the Rabbit, one of the youngest Sonic characters who's basically the tails to Amy's Sonic. Cream was first introduced in Sonic Advance 2 for the Game Boy Advance, and it was her gameplay style in that game that makes her a character I find highly entertaining. In Sonic Advance 2 and 3, Cream can use Cheese the Chow as an attack, and he can tear apart any enemy in seconds, including boss fights. The juxtaposition between this innocent kid that respectfully calls everyone Mr. and Mrs. that also happens to wield a weapon of mass destruction is something I find humorous, what can I say? She's pretty much been dropped from the game cast recently, and that's a darn shame. I don't even mind Big in this game, as he plays like a normal Sonic character, and despite being a very strange man, I think his character was played relatively straight as a guy who just wants to help his friends, so I guess I can't complain. So Amy wants to find Sonic, Cream wants to find Chocola, and Big wants to find Froggy. Again. And that sets them out in their mission, which of course, Sonic would never capture innocent animals, so what's up? Well, fans will recognize the red eye from the intro. Metal Sonic is back in this new form, but during the actual campaigns, we don't know what's happening with that, so we'll have to wait and see. Now I can mention the characterization of Sonic Heroes and how, yeah, it's fine by me. It's fair to say that this game gave more legitimacy to the idea that Amy is like a literal psycho. And yeah, I guess so. None of these team clash scenes make any sense though. 
I feel like Amy taking a position of leadership over her friends is a vast improvement over her role as comedic relief in Sonic Adventure 2, being a logical follow-up to the story from Adventure 1, I feel. So while that one scene is stupid, I think her role in the rest of the game is just fine. Besides that, I feel like all the other characters are good in this one. Dr. Eggman is still my favorite. Team Sonic and Team Dark are all consistent with how they've been, with good dialogue between them, and that's that. Come on, tell me you weren't scared. If it wasn't for us, you wouldn't have had a chance. Well, maybe you're right. Thanks, Knuckles. You too, Tails. This is the first time Knuckles' involvement in a big game had nothing to do with the Master Emerald, which I don't think is a problem yet. Like, Knuckles as a character having no function will be a problem as soon as Sonic Riders, but I think him helping Sonic and Tails here on this supposedly life-threatening mission makes enough sense to me. It was by this point that they decided that contriving reasons for the Master Emerald to be involved in the stories was more trouble than it's worth, so yeah, here it is. The game knows this and references it every now and again, which I'd say is a fair enough trade-off in the short term. Team Rose has the gimmick of being the mode designed for new players, making it my least favorite. Even starting off on a required tutorial stage before you begin Seaside Hill. I feel like Seaside Hill itself is one of those areas that's pretty natural as far as tutorialization is concerned. I've always found dedicated tutorial areas to be pretty bland. This one isn't too egregious, but still. Sonic Heroes is already a game that has plenty of player guidance to like an unnecessary degree where by the last level we're still seeing signposts over obstacles that show you which character to use and what set pieces. Like they really didn't think the kids could handle this one, huh? But then again, maybe it's not the kids. Team Sonic and Team Dark's campaigns are basically the same, but Team Dark will fight more numerous and tougher enemies and occasionally take advantage of side paths that Team Sonic would not. When I play Sonic Heroes, it will either be Team Sonic or Team Dark levels. Team Rose suffers from it being too easy. Stages start towards the middle from where a Team Sonic level would begin and end sooner therefore shaving a few minutes off the time at the end, but also not really providing as much satisfaction in completing it. I mean, it's still Sonic Heroes, it still has all the same stages and mechanics, and it's still not so cut down to where it's like a completely different game or anything, but it's still my personal least favorite campaign due to the overall decreased difficulty. Most people's least favorite is Team Chaotix. Here we go! <clears throat> yeah, let's go! SBO, Charmy, and Vector have a dynamic I really like. These three dudes are in a struggling detective agency as they get a mysterious client that asks for their services. I've got a bad feeling about this. SBO, don't be silly. Besides, you know our policy. We never turn down work that pays. Yeah, you know our policy. Come on, boys. Let's go. Yes, sir. Roger. Never turning down work that pays sends the three on their quest where they get treated like crap by everybody. Excuse me, miss. I was wondering if I could ask you something. If it's about a date, it'll have to wait. Date? You think this is a joke, you little brat? Now hand over that chow nice and easy. I bet you you're the ones who took chocolate chow. What? Man, who are those creeps over there? What's up, SBO? And you are... Just what do you think you're doing here? Who's this broad? Our client's adversary, perhaps. You mean the bad guys? You guys don't fool me. I know what you're after. Better stay out of my way. That scene with Team Dark is really funny to me. Like, these three are just minding their own business, and Rouge is like, man, what are those creeps up to? She tried to justify herself afterwards, like, I wonder. Never mind, those guys were definitely up to no good. Team Chaotix are characters revived from 1995's Knuckles' is Chaotix. Yes, it's pronounced Knuckles is, even though it's just an S apostrophe. I don't know what school you guys went to or what era, but I'm telling you the truth. Just look at this line in the subtitles from Sonic Adventure 1. My heart has always been inside the Master Emerald along with Chaos's. See people, no need to consider me the grammar snake oil salesman. Knuckles is Chaotix is the name of the game. A game that was totally terrible, mind you. I covered it back in the first Dark Age video, but as I said in that video, the Chaotix in this game are completely different from how they were on the 32X. I mean, where do you begin? Oh, I know. I mentioned in passing that the 32X game is no longer canon as of this game because of circumstantial evidence, like how the Chaotix has been turned into a detective agency barely capable of paying the rent when they were... Well, they weren't really anything in the old game. The team has no relations to Knuckles or Dr. Eggman in this one. Mighty's neither in the game nor mentioned, yada yada yada. This statement made people very upset. I used the fact that Charmy was like 16 in the Chaotix manual, but like 6 in the Heroes manual, and sure, maybe that was just the US manual so it doesn't count. But seriously, listen to this line after Ocean Palace. So, you're the ones who are playing games with my army? Sorry, just part of the job. That's the evil genius, Dr. Eggman. Doctor who? 
Yes! Let me show you who I really am. So Charmy has no idea who Dr. Eggman is, and then you might argue, well, maybe Chaotix is after heroes. Sorry, if we were to believe the current Sonic rhetoric that the design change in Adventure 1 is canon, then Black-Eyed Knuckles from the Chaotix game would have to be before Purple-Eyed Sonic Heroes. Sorry, this is yet another reason why Sonic 4 wouldn't be canon by today's standards. Since Sonic's design evolving is supposed to be canon now, we can't just go from Sonic 3 to Sonic 4 to Sonic Adventure. But anyway. If you want the grand slam of evidence, here's an interview with Takashi Izuka from when Heroes was in its pre-release. He literally says he doesn't really consider Heroes as bringing back the Chaotix as we knew them, instead taking the designs and names of these characters and rebuilding them from the ground up with new designs from Yuji Uwakawa, and bam, we have the iconic detective agency we know today that have gone on to appear in countless Sonic games since Heroes. I also like how Izuka throws shade at the 32X game by mentioning that Sonic Team had nothing to do with that one. Like, yeah, we know it was trash. Back to the game review. Team Chaotix's special gimmick is that they follow a mission-based formula, as opposed to the point A to point B action of Team Sonic, Team Dark, and Team Rose. The mysterious client is such a goofball that he, for some reason, instead of wanting immediate rescue, he decides to have the Chaotix prove their worth by collecting 10 hermit crabs, saving a chow from a box, collecting rings and chips at the casino, blowing out torches, collecting keys, going total stealth through the jungle, it's completely absurd, and I love it. And it's canon, too. Like, the client says in the first cutscene that they have to prove their worth, and in Lost Jungle, the Chaotix must collect Chow leading into the boss with Team Rose, which I showed earlier where the Chaotix try to take Chi as the Chow from Cream. This is where nostalgia can get in the way of my assessment, since Team Chaotix is infamous for missions like Grand Metropolis where you have to kill every single enemy and must start back from the beginning in order to find the one you missed if you missed any, or blowing out the torches in Mystic Mansion. I remember struggling with some of these missions back in the day, but I completed them all without a guide eventually. So what I mean to say is that for this run, Team Chaotix really didn't give me that much trouble since, while I don't know them off the top of my head like I would collectible of say Mega Man X1 through X4, I have played this game enough to get no trouble with Team Chaotix. So therefore, I enjoyed this campaign for the extra variety added to the game, but your mileage may vary on this one. Now to address the crock in the room, the combat. Sonic Heroes of all the platformers yet has had the most amount of combat, which first demands discussion of the power type characters Knuckles, Omega, Big, and Vector. These characters are the best if you're just running along narrow ground that doesn't really require much platforming as the acceleration of the power characters is nowhere near as high as the speed characters. As the power character, you have the basic attacks and the ability to use the speed and flight characters as fireballs against the enemies, using fans that are also conveniently located on the ground to glide up for short bursts, destroying heavy objects, and just being the go-to character for these combat situations. This is another reason Heroes gets heat. The enemies now all have health bars to increase the need of a power character, but I'm fine with it as it's not a change that gets in the way of the game. Like I said, I think Heroes has a really good flow to it, and wrecking enemies with the power character is a part of that. You might have issues with Knuckles and Omega as they can't attack from a standstill like Big and Vector can, and my strat for this is that if you press the attack button numerous times at Knuckles without moving the stick, you'll do more short-range punches as opposed to the big ones that are prone to sending you flying. The same actually goes for Omega, as you can just let go of the stick while attacking and travel less of a distance. I think the combat has a decent amount of options in it for a speed-based platformer as well. Some enemies require the Thunder Shot to be knocked out of the sky for the power type to reach, or a shield that the speed character needs to blow away. When it comes to smaller enemies, I have a personal strategy. When using the homing attack, the fly and power characters will homing attack with you if they were just standing there before you jumped and you can use this to get extra damage in. Throughout the stages, you'll have multiple opportunities to level your characters up from 0 to 3. Each additional level will make each character more powerful in combat, like the level 3 homing attack that can ride up poles and knock away shields, the level 3 thunder shoot that can destroy enemies full stop, and the power characters that really make some waves with their final attacks. The main nitpick I have with the combat is a bit obscure, but something that I think is true nonetheless. The sound design. Sonic the Fighters and Sonic Battle have shown how much more fun combat can be when having stretchy animations for the characters with impactful sound design. Batman Arkham City and Batman Arkham Origins have a near identical combat system, but one of them has much better sound design than the other. Take a listen. Sonic Heroes is more of an Arkham Origins when blowing up robots, so it just doesn't leave as much of an impact. Maybe something along the lines of the Teen Titans game would be good. Well, that's enough of that. Don't want people to expect that inevitable Teen Titans retrospective anytime soon. Special stages from the classic games have returned. 
in Sonic 2 and Sonic 3, Super Sonic was a playable transformation, but in Sonic Adventure 1 and 2, this and the Chaos Emeralds were locked to story events. In Sonic Heroes, it's still a story event, but you unlock the Emeralds by playing special stages. Similar to the Sonic Advance games, the Emeralds are zone specific, which was not the case in the classics, but luckily all four teams share an Emerald count like Advance 1 and unlike Advance 2. Getting into the special stages might be tricky for some players as you have to collect a key hidden in the stage and then get to the end without taking a hit. Sonic Advance 3 also used keys for its special stages, although in that game I said it was better handled than Heroes as you needed to die to lose a key as opposed to taking a hit. At this point, I can see the argument either way. Not taking a hit's more challenging, I suppose, but also more punishing, and these stages can be pretty long. It's also worth noting that Act 2 is the only one you can get an Emerald in. When you get into the special stage, you have to chase after the Emerald and catch it before it reaches the end. Pretty simple in concept, but the controls are pretty slippery, I'll give you that. However, I still don't feel like these stages are particularly difficult. You know, just follow the right path and boost as these orbs fill up a boost gauge at the top of the screen. Taking a hit pretty much means it's over, but you have four playthroughs to get them all. I got most of my Emeralds in my Team Sonic, run and got the other three or so as the other teams. Team Row is being the easiest to get the Emeralds as because they're obviously shorter stages and weaker enemies. I said in the previous video that the A ranks were at their best in SA2 and Sonic Heroes, and now it's time to see how that claim holds up. I did A rank Sonic Heroes after I did SA2 last year, but coming back to the Heroes stages for A ranks after I beat all the campaigns definitely showed that while Adventure 2 and Heroes are pretty much the same system for grading, I find getting A ranks to be a lot more fun in Adventure 2 than Heroes. Getting an A in a stage just requires that you be fast, get as many points as you can with trick rings and enemies, and level every character up without dying. That's fine and good, but it's the secondary objectives that can really knock the wind out of your sails. For Team Sonic, you have to beat the stage with a time limit, and what makes this boring is the fact that the times are pretty generous, so it just feels like you're playing the same stage again. Team Dark must defeat 100 enemies, and you'd think this would be a snap given how many enemies there are in every stage in Heroes, and there's where you'd be wrong. You're probably going to reach the end of a stage and have to return to the start of it just to get the rest, when while that seems like a guaranteed D rank, you can actually get an A, even if it takes you like 10 minutes. Team Rose must get 200 rings per stage, which is very easy and dull, and Team Chaotix definitely has the worst. Not a challenge that cannot be overcome, but the most tedious having to find all 20 Hermit Crabs or this perfect stealth bullshit in Ocean Palace. Getting every A rank unlocks Super Hard Mode, where Team Sonic runs through every stage at an increased difficulty, and you only have one set of lives to do it on. It's a fine challenge, but at the same time it's just playing the same stages again. You can at least save your progress and resume later if you get short-winded, but still, this mode doesn't really leave much of a big impression on me, as your reward for playing the same stages at minimum 112 times plus the 7 boss fights is playing them again. This is also where the glitchier side of Heroes really becomes obnoxious. Talk about A rank ruined, am I right? Like when something like that, or this, or here where the two frogs in Lost Jungle activated at the same time leaving me screwed with progression, there's just nothing you can do but swallow your pride and start the long level again. Stuff I don't mind with just playing normally, but A ranks be really tiring in this game, just crossing each stage off the checklist. You also have to get boss ranks now. None of these bosses besides the Egg Emperor are very good. The rest of them are all just button mashing until everything dies, quite literally in the case of these bloody palace floors that they call boss fights at the end of zones 3 and 6. These character battles are just broken on PC. The trick to send every character flying off the arena with the tornado just doesn't work. Making a boss that might last 20 seconds last 10 minutes. But that basically covers most of the content in Sonic Heroes, so let's talk some aesthetics. I mean, look at this game, easily the best looking Sonic game released up to this point. The game doesn't have the kind of atmospheric details that areas of SA1 would have. When it comes to the sheer amount of colors and lights on the screen, Sonic Heroes definitely wins, especially with the cutscenes. Like I've said about a game like Jack 1, the animators didn't really have to make cutscenes for a very in-depth story, but better animation and lip sync is what it is. The plastic shine look the characters have in this game is certainly take it or leave it, but I've always had a fondness for it, it just looks very vibrant and defined against the backgrounds. Especially needed as the camera is much further pulled back than the previous 3D games. The cutscenes, and the CG ones especially, suffer from clipping and other such issues, and some generally dated models and video compression, but certainly not something I feel like making a big stink about. After all. This game is in Sly 4. Sonic Heroes is the last full game where the cast from Sonic Adventure played these characters, which makes me sad to say. The next era of Sonic actors are good, and we'll definitely talk about it when we get to those games, but still, the Japanese cast has hardly ever changed their actors since Sonic Adventure 1, and it would have been nice to see this cast continue to grow with each epic story added to the lore, because as far as delivery is concerned, Ryan Drummond as Sonic, Scott Dreyer as Knuckles, Dean Bristow as Eggman, Jennifer Dooliard as Amy, David Humphrey as Shadow, Lonnie Manella as Rouge, John St. John as Big and Omega, 
Mark Biagi as Vector are all so natural as their characters. I also love Ryan Drummond as Metal Sonic. With all the filters they gave him, he just sounds so villainous and I'm here for it. Ryan Drummond played Knuckles in Shuffle and did a few lines as Shadow during the final boss of SA2, so he's voiced every Sonic rival that existed during his time as Sonic. And now that means, I'd be very curious to see what his delivery would sound like as Silver or Jet the Hawk. I think the actors for Cream, Espio, and Charmy are all... fine. But ultimately very replaceable in the grand scheme of things, as their next actors do basically the same for me as the Heroes ones do. Tails is now voiced by William Corkery. His father played Espio and his sister was Charmy. But he was the one that had the worst acting lessons, clearly. What are we gonna do, Sonic? By far the worst Tails voice of all time. I mean, he does sound like an eight-year-old boy, but he's just really terrible at acting, what can I say? On the whole, the main problem with the acting in Heroes isn't even the acting. It's the very poor translation of dialogue. My favorite example is a little obscure, but it is still an example nonetheless. Take the boss fight between Team Sonic and Team Dark, for example. When you start the boss fight, Shadow asks this question about Sonic being with his twin, and which is like, what? And the dialogue has the tendency to be really corny. Let's find Eggman and show him the real power of teamwork. Let's get ready to do this. We'll show that creep the real superpower of teamwork. It's earnest enough to where I can laugh at it and not think twice, but definitely not how I prefer Sonic to be done. Other instances of character-based comedy can actually work pretty well for me. But yeah, this is our last main game with these actors and they shall be missed. The ones in this group that were there the longest really brought these characters to life in the West, and for that, they will always be remembered in the Sonic community. And then there's the soundtrack, which I think is pretty good. When looking at the music for the stage, I think a lot of the music in Sonic Heroes is hummable, but not something I'd want to hear outside of the game. Sonic Adventure 1 and 2 had much better soundtracks, I'd say but I do have my favorites that are pretty good. few tracks that I think start out good at first, but go in a bit of a lame direction, like the Egg Albatross boss fight theme, for example. But you know what makes up for the main soundtrack? My absolute favorite vocal collection the series has seen yet. Not containing as much genre variety as, say, Adventure 1, 2, or even Shadow in 06, but I just think every single theme in this game is an absolute banger, and I would totally listen to most of these over most vocal tracks in the games I just listed. Like the main theme. What goes up must come down. Yeah, my feet don't touch the ground. A collection of theme tunes so catchy and good that Team Sonic's theme, We Can, is my least favorite, just being alright. So but let's go ahead and give a listen to the other three team themes, which I think are absolutely fantastic. Specifically Team Dark and Team Chaotix with these kick-ass vocals and instrumentals backing them. Anyway, all story points converge at the Egg Fleet, where each team takes on the Doctor's Armada one battleship at a time. The end game of Sonic Heroes is a highlight of every playthrough. Like, the opening levels were good, the game kind of crawls in the middle, but the three best zones are at the end, Frog Forest, Hang Castle, and Egg Fleet. If you want robust Sonic levels with free exploration, great music, and set pieces, then I think each of these zones is something cool to offer. Each team then defeats their own version of Dr. Eggman in the Egg Emperor mech, which yes, is canon, because Team Sonic and Team Rose directly intersect at the end. Which of course begs the question, what's really going on here? 
Well, Team Sonic has saved the day, Team Rose has saved Froggy and Chocola, Team Dark defeated what they thought was Eggman only for Rouge and Omega to find the army of Shadowbots, and Team Chaotix meets their true client, Dr. Eggman, which the game couldn't have made any more obvious if they tried. Strangely enough, I had the same weird feeling about our client's real identity. It could be you know who. But that means that the whole time, Metal Sonic has been up to something without the Doctor's help. Before I can get back to that, can we just laugh at how Eggman has the resources to build space stations, flying fortresses, and a fucking airship armada? But when Team Chaotix is ready to take their pay, this happens. Hold on, you guys. It's no trick. And besides, I plan on paying you. You'll be rewarded handsomely for helping me. As soon as I conquer the world, I will pay you! Some nerve promising what you ain't got. We've been had. J -j Just wait a minute. Just listen to me. Take this, you bad man! I just love how much of a freaking goon Dr. Eggman is getting beat up by these other goons. That part just makes me laugh every time. With each story complete, it's time for the last story, which basically serves as an epilogue for those who beat all four stories and want to learn what happened. Dr. Eggman, of course, rebuilt Metal Sonic, who imprisoned Dr. Eggman and started the plan to gain as much power as possible, luring Sonic and friends out to steal their powers, even creating his own creations, like how he can multiply and pretend to be Dr. Eggman to fight each team. As Tails actually reflected on the fact that the fake Eggman that they beat wasn't built by Eggman after the Egg Albatross boss fight. It's not an Eggman robot. Sonic! Knuckles! Wait for me! All lifeform data successfully copied. Metal Sonic posed as Sonic to steal Froggy and Chocola for a very specific reason. Chaos data has been copied. Chaos Data. Froggy got swallowed by Chaos in Adventure 1, and Chaos originally was the guardian of the Chow colony because he himself was a mutated Chow that protected the other ones. And so all Chow have some sort of Chaos DNA in them. So now, Metal Sonic has the powers of Sonic, Tails, Knuckles, and the God of Destruction, Chaos, from SA1. But he also got really lucky as Team Dark has the ultimate life form on their side, and he does not miss the opportunity to take that power. Let's go. gaining the ability to use Chaos Control at will. He does not absorb anything from Team Chaotix as they had nothing to do with him, because Eggman was the one who contacted them in the first place for rescue, not Metal Sonic. So Sonic Heroes still has a somewhat interconnected plot, just not as much as the previous games. You could critique Eggman for being pretty much useless in this scenario, but I'm actually not going to, mainly because Metal Sonic has taken complete control of everything Eggman owns and has become the most powerful being in the series yet. There is nothing Eggman can do about it. Besides, the Doctor made Metal Sonic capable of these feats, so no wonder he's the one most terrified since he has no control of the situation. So now all the teams must work together to stop Metal Sonic's first transformation, Metal Madness. This is a pretty simple boss fight for sure, like you play as Team Rose, Team Chaotix, and Team Dark, as you have to hit these obvious weak spots with whatever character does not correspond with the color displayed. Blue means the speed character won't do any damage, yellow for the flying character, and red for the power character. But if you made it this far, no doubt you shall beat this boss fight. With the other characters buying Team Sonic the time to transform into Super Sonic and these, uh, super powered tails and knuckles and bubbles? Yeah, they're super powered, but I guess Super Tails and Super Knuckles have been retconned out of existence. Ah, well. This is also the first appearance of the Super Sonic design that we all know today. He had a Super Saiyan Goku look to him in Sonic 2 and Sonic 3, and then in the adventure games he just looked like a yellow shadow. And now we have this look. Retroactively, I'm totally kicking myself for how in the SA2 video I used this art of Super Sonic in the final boss fight and not this one from Sonic Shuffle I also have, which would have been much more fitting of the SA2 Super Sonic design, but there's nothing I can do about it now, because it's final boss time, as the Metal Overlord takes flight and Team Sonic is ready to face it head on. Not nearly as epic a boss as the final Hazard from SA2, but an all-around better boss fight than Perfect Chaos from SA1. I just love all the spectacle here. Like, Team Supersonic can't even lay a dent in Metal Sonic in this form without using a combined Team Blast. He's nearly invincible as he flies into the sky, grabbing a giant ship from the air fleet that we literally played an 8-minute stage traveling through, and chucks it at you like it's nothing, as super-powered Knuckles can destroy it just the same. This Neo-Metal Sonic will get flack for a two-dimensional motivation, but here I'm gonna disagree. 
Metal Sonic was a blank canvas character, which I did give credit to the design for that reason in Sonic CD, but I think Shiro Miyakawa gave him some interesting and revealing dialogue here in the final fight. Since Jeb of JebTube already did the work of going through the audio files and playing it for you, let's just take the lazy way out and see what he had to say on the matter. Sonic, I was created for the sole purpose of destroying you, but I can never seem to defeat you. That is why I transformed my own body with my own hands. Hmm. You actually thought you could defeat me by transforming into a monster? But that was the past. Now you're nothing but a speck of dust to me. See me as I am, no longer afraid of anything. Indeed, a large portion of Metal's twisted motivation is that he just wanted to defeat Sonic, the very thing he was programmed for from the beginning. There's also an added little bit of depth that he used to even be afraid of always just being an inferior Sonic. And I think that this is very cool. Like, Metal Sonic wants to take over the world and roboticize everyone because of the fact that he hates being Metal Sonic. He'll do anything to destroy Sonic and prove that he's Sonic. And in a world of all robots, he won't be Metal Sonic, right? I find that to be an interesting motivation that serves as a good narrative throughline for Heroes' story. Complimenting this final boss is what I'm made of. The most badass Crush 40 song of all time. Let's hear it. Like a million faces, I've recognized them all. And one by one they all become the number as they fall. In the face of reason, I can't take no That was pretty tough. Too bad it's all over. For you! And that's it for Sonic Heroes. Metal Sonic is defeated and returns back to his original form from Sonic CD. And with that, everyone goes their separate ways, while the Chaotix chase Eggman for the money he owes them. Guess that's it for this case. Guess so. But what about our money? Man, I almost forgot! That's light ball! Could watch that over and over. Thus ending Sonic Heroes. Alright! Our next adventure awaits us, so there's no time to waste! Yeah! We're Sonic Heroes! I really like Sonic Heroes. It certainly isn't the kind of next-gen epic Sonic experience that Sonic 3K, Adventure 2, or Adventure 1 even were. But I think Sonic Heroes achieved what it set out to do, even being a better game than SA1 in my opinion. Providing a classic styled campaign with fun levels, replay value, and an entertaining story with our favorite characters. It's not a perfect game, as I wish it controlled better, overall wish it had more polish, but with the game we got, I think it's another great Sonic game. Like, I just tell you guys how I feel about the games I play, and with that, Sonic Heroes is just a game I love. Definitely one of my favorite games in the series, as every time I come back to it, it's a good time, and I could hardly ask for more. Yeah, sometimes my conclusions can be pretty short, but I think this review pretty much speaks for itself. I still have another Sonic video in me before the year is over, so next time we'll be taking a look at Sonic's handheld adventures on the Game Boy Advance. But with that being a small scale video, I might as well take some time now to say I hope it's clear why I, as someone who grew up playing the Sonic games of the 2000s and the games of the 90s at the same time, would feel like the adventure era deserves a unique slot in Sonic's history. There's both a massive progression of the series, no doubt, with the changed designs and new gameplay styles and so on, but is also a continuation of what the classic games did so well, which as I've said before, was creating a kick-ass character with a great world and cast of characters with ever-expanding world building and marketability. The Adventure Era, in my opinion, just didn't do the kind of damage that games I consider the Dark Age did. So that's why I separate them. Having said that, I think it's cool that I've gotten to spread the good word of all the Sonic games I've praised thus far, as the retrospective's only really just getting started. And in the meantime, thank you all for watching, and I'll see you next time.